best, but uh, hopefully it will be okay. Okay. I think it's okay for now. Let us see. Okay, so good evening, everybody, and good morning to <laughs> some of you on the east coast of the United States. I'm very much uh, pleased and honored to invite Dr. Nathan Badenoch, who is a good old friend of India and the CIL, to the 19th lecture of the 53rd Foundation Lecture Series. As uh, most of you know, we have been uh, looking into different aspects of languages and linguistics during the last 18 lectures. In fact, the last lecture was by Greg Anderson on the typology of Munda languages. So in a way, it is nice that we are continuing the Austro-Asiatic uh, chain. And here we have Nathan, who is going to speak on Mundari. I request uh, Professor Shailendra Mohan, Director CIL, to say a few words and welcome Dr. Nathan Badenoch formally. Okay. Namaskar. Uh, welcome, Professor Nathan, today's guest of honor. Our esteemed colleagues at the Central Institute of Indian Languages, Mysore, uh, friends and virtual participants. I take this opportunity to extend our warm welcome to Professor Nathan Badenoch to speak on the culture of expressives. Professor Nathan has been working on expressives for a long time, especially in the South Asian context. It is a real privilege for all of us to listen to him on this occasion. We are thankful to you for agreeing to deliver the lecture on the occasion of 53rd Foundation Day, lecture series organized by CL Mysore. I think this is the 20th in this series. 19th. 19th. Oh, this is the 19th in the series. Uh, in fact, we have completed something like a 50% of lecture series. As we know, expressive as a linguistic phenomena is a characteristic feature of South Asian linguistic area, but received very scant discussion in literature. In grammar books, we hardly find discussion on expressives. In this context, uh, Professor Nathan and Professor Tusiki Osada has published the dictionary of Bundari expressives. Thank you very much, both of you. I hope Many more discussions and descriptions on expressives in Indian languages will come up after listening to Professor Nathan's work. <laughs> in this context, the real challenge in understanding expressive is to devise methodological tools in ex eliciting expressive expressions. The relationship between indexality and iconicity in expressives is a problematic zone. I hope after Professor Nathan's talk, we'll be will get better understanding of this phenomena in South Asian languages uh, scenario. Once again, we are thankful to you, uh, Professor Nathan, for sharing your uh, valuable time with us. Welcome once again. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Dr. Badenoch, Dr. Nathan Badenoch, or Nathan, as he's fondly called by all of us, works as an associate professor in the Department of Global Interdisciplinary Studies at Villanova University in the United States. Of course, uh, he has interdisciplinary degrees as well. He studied comparative culture at Sophia University and development studies at the University of London. After that, he went away from the West and he moved to the East, that is to Japan, to Kyoto University, where he obtained his PhD in Southeast Asian Studies. With this educational background in interdisciplinary and area studies, he uses interdisciplinary approaches in his work too, insights from linguistics, anthropology, and geography in his work. He has traveled extensively and worked and lived in various uh, places in Asia. 
he works on uh, expressives uh, like already charendra mohan introduced the topic and also talked about briefly about his book this one of the topics which is well known he works on that he works on multilingualism and traditional and uh, ecological knowledge besides this his interests are also on poetics performance and sound maybe we will get another opportunity to listen to that part of his uh, work maybe ethno poetry and uh, language and express is all connected he has several uh, publications and he teaches uh, he has also taught advanced japanese which is impressive i never knew that um, nathan was teaching japanese i keep the introduction brief because we would like to listen to you and uh, also this is the first talk in uh, the month of october it's that it's very very nice the title is also expressive so it's a very beautiful month here in uh, india because we are all in festive mood welcoming dashara the puja so we are expressive in different ways so i think it's a very very nice uh, coincidence that your talk is scheduled uh, today i once again welcome you on behalf of everyone here and uh, request you to take over from me okay thank you namaskar johar thank you very much to ciil for the uh very nice opportunity to speak about this topic today um it's an honor to be part of the lecture series um in the ciil foundation day uh festivities that are going on um and uh, thank you for the very kind introduction um my name is nathan badenock and as uh in the introduction i'm associate professor of japanese and asian studies at villanova university um i'm as was mentioned i'm have multidisciplinary training background and have worked in most my well, east southeast and south asia um so i yeah try to consider myself as an asianist although um most of my my heavy work has been done in southeast asia um but i'm very happy to have had the opportunity uh starting when i was in kyoto to uh start to work in south asia as well on expressives uh it's a unseasonably cool morning here in philadelphia um and so we are also very attuned to the changing of the seasons and if english had more expressives i'm sure we would be using many of them as we talk about our days um so with that i would like to get into um my talk let me see about sharing the screen here and uh just a second please Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um okay, uh today I'd like to talk about uh the culture of expressives, um local and real and regional perspectives from the linguistic ethnography of Mundari. Um I didn't I was not aware that uh Greg Anderson had presented on uh typological issues of of Munda languages uh in the last talk, which is very good uh because I think that there will be more of a uh complementary uh dynamic rather than uh any sort of reduplication because i'm really uh interested today in speaking about the culture of expressive so looking at expressives um sort of from the everyday use um to see how uh expressives in the mundari language provide insights on munda 
linkages between ling language and culture, language and ecology, um, and language and uh, what we call linguistic ideology. Um, and as uh, Professor Mohan mentioned in his introduction, um, one of the key challenges in studying expressives is, of course, the methodological issues. And although I'm talking about culture, uh, cultural perspectives, I think that one of the main messages will be one about uh, uh, methodological questions as well. So I'm going to share uh, with you some of uh, the experiences that I've, I've had working with colleagues and speakers as well. So with that. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, Nathan. You're yeah. showing the presenter view to us. Can you oh. do a full screen? It, in, in me, it is full screen. What I'm seeing is the presenter view. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When I when I tried to share a second ago, it wasn't showing me the the notes, so I did the other one. Let me try again. Sorry about that. No issues. Ah, is it better now? This is. It's perfect. Okay. It's okay. expressive. Yes, very good. Very good. Um, okay. Apologies for the technical difficulty. Um, right. So that was uh, a brief introduction into what we're going to do. So I would like to start out um, just with some data um, to put us somewhere, uh, locate us in the linguistic map. Um, and give you an idea of how I consider expressives as poetics of daily life. Um, in, in Mundari, as well as many, many uh, other languages, expressives may cover a very large area of uh, language usage. So different genres of language will use expressives, um, as well as many different areas of uh, semantic areas. Um, and so, to put us into the, the, the idea of expressives in, in daily life. Um, here are some expressives uh, in Mundari that have to do with the natural landscapes. This is particularly um, regarding rain. Um, and uh, recently I've done some work um, to look at uh, expressives in, in, the, in, the, in the natural world. And we have expressives in the first group here uh, that are telling us about the weather in general, the coming of the rain. So we have things about the thunder rumbling in the distance, garar gurur. We have flashes of lightning, a single flash of lightning, bgd, bgd. Um, when we can see and hear rain falling in distance, sao sao. Um, in anticipation of the rain, the frogs may start croaking ter ter. Large toads may start croaking when the rain comes, saying tarat tarat. Um, and these are, as you can see, capturing a number of, of uh, phenomena from sound to motion to light um, to natural beings in the, in the landscape. Once the rain starts to fall, we have things like top dip, scattered rain with normal sized rain sops dripping in many places. Things like top dip, scattered rain with larger in raindrops, which will soon end and may be dripping in, in many places. Um, and I'm sure that by now already, probably, especially with top tip and top tip, uh, speakers of other Indian languages will uh, be thinking of similar, similar uh, words. Uh, when we move to a bit away from the rain directly to look at water dripping, we see things, we hear things such as top tip, water dripping in singular drops, top top, water dripping in big drops in one place, jotop, totop large drops dripping with a constant rhythm and jitab jotab, water dripping one by one, but not in a regular rhythm. So we see quite a wide range of nuance um, being conveyed in these expressives. Um, we can also recognize different patterns of reduplication, vowel and consonant uh, alternation. Um, and yeah, we can see that that there's a, a, a very deep level of, of linguistic nuance that's being uh, conveyed by these these expressives, and I should of course mention that this is just a, a very small selection of the of the large large uh, vocabulary of rain and related topics in Mundari. 
So all the way from such sort of simple and common natural settings in the in the in the, the ecology, all the way to expressives in what we could call spiritual landscapes. Um, when I was working uh, with Madhu Parti, who is the 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 Mundas, Mundari speaker who has been so uh, generous and uh, insightful in working together on expressives. Uh, in one session, we were talking about an expressive that was used to depict the appearance of, of frizzy hair, which is Targal Turgul. Um, and we quickly got into a discussion that was surrounded, that was based in a, a song. As I'll discuss in a, in a moment, uh, discussion of expressives often ends up in song um, when we're working in Mundari. And came upon this, this uh, line from a song that was talking about uh, frizzy hair uh, and was talking about uh, the, the translation that frizzy head of hair, ribbon swaying back and forth, even as an unmarried girl, you are learning to become a najom. Um, najom is a type of uh, witch. Um, and it was interesting because ripi ripi, an expressive of the appearance of frizzy hair, different from targal turgul. Um, and we got into the discussion about what's what's the difference and why do we have these. And and it turns out that the ripi ripi um, had carried more nuance about the this the spiritual uh, issues, talking about the the characteristic personality of this girl, um, what it represented in the imagination of the speaker and the hearer. Uh, something that was a little bit uh, abnormal in appearance and related to abnormality in terms of social roles um, and quickly show how how these expressives are not just uh, a matter of repeating sounds and simple uh, things that we see in the natural landscape, but go very deeply into the cultural and spiritual life of people. Um, we have also, when we're talking about poetics, we can see bo ripiripi, so the head Ripi Ripi and Pita, the, the hair ribbon, Dalai Dalai. And so these are, are um, opposed in, a, in, in a, a poetic line here. And Dalai Dalai uh, being the sight of something swaying back and forth. Um, but here it was stressed that this is indicative of the fact that the, the hair ribbon is not able to control the Ripi Ripi hair. Um, and that's an important part of the, of the poetic message here to indicate the power of the of this girl as she's uh, perhaps starting to become a, a Najom. Um, the discussion then, of course, led to questions about what are expressives of hair that have different types of, of cultural meaning. And for example, if, if Ripi Ripi and Targal Turgul are sort of uh, more abnormal types of, of hair, what is the more stereotypical uh, positive images of hair? And we got things such as Jurui Burui, straight hair pulled back smoothly and applied with mustard oil. Um, and when that type of hair swings back and forth as a woman moves her head to the side, the expressive is dalai, uh, daloe daloe, which is related to dalai dalai, of course. Um, but the, the symbolism of the, the vowel there is different. So very, very, again, very, very fine nuances that give not only the detail of the sensory perception, but also the cultural and, uh, well, in this case, perhaps spiritual implications of uh, the use of that expressive. Okay, Munda and Mundari for a second. Now we'll, we'll step out of the, the initial data here to, to um, do a little bit more introduction here. Uh, Mundari language um, that I've been working on is spoken by about a million and a half people in Jharkhand, West Bengal, and Orissa. Um, Mundari, Munda sometimes used uh, interchangeably, but Munda is generally considered a larger group of languages. In Mundari itself, however, the language is referred to as most commonly Munda Jagar or even Hordo Jagar, which is just the, the language of the Munda or language of people. Uh, internal diversity, as uh, anyone who listened to Professor Anderson's talk last time would know, um, is quite high. Um, I won't uh, go into that too much, but I just wanted to give a map here to show uh, the location of Munda speakers here, here, and even uh, up here near uh, Nepali border. 
Uh, other languages that are closely related um, include Santali and Birhor um, uh, with very large, well, Santali with very large uh, population of speakers to Bihar, which is uh, much smaller and even smart, severely endangered languages such as Borom. Um, so it's a very diverse uh, family with a lot of internal uh, complexity. So studying expressives. I've already talked a little bit about the data, but let's step back for a moment and see how we can uh, define expressives. Um, expressives are used, uh, the word expressive is used very much in South Asia, also South Asia. Um, but other areas of the world and other areas of linguistics use the word uh, idiophone. In Japan, mimetics is a common term that we heard. Um, and these are used often interchangeably. Um, there's a, a large discussion about you know, terminology um, in this field because it is very important. Um, but the definition of, of what we're talking about is partially difficult because uh, we're dealing in, in bits of language and linguistics that have not been uh, well theoretized. And also because the class of words called expressives behave so differently in, in, in many different languages. And so um, I will continue to use expressives. But one important point to make here is that what we're talking about is something very much beyond onomatopoeia. So we're not just talking about replication or imitation of sound. Um, and an important point for the South Asian uh, linguistic area is that we're also talking beyond echo nouns. Um, and because of the, the defining characteristics of uh, reduplication, some types of noun uh, sorry, some types of consonant uh, alternation. It's been common to consider uh, echo words in the noun class uh, together with expressives. And for reasons of, well, expressivity and reasons of uh, semantics, um, reasons of syntax, um, in the studies that I've been doing, we've left these out because they are uh, quite different. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, things such as the V uh, overriding in the reduplication in Hindi, where you would have kanavana for food and stuff like that, or in Tamil, patu kitu with the, the, the key sound in the second reduplicated syllable, song and related things. So this is a way to make to make a generalized sort of noun group out of out of a more specific noun. Um, and this is something that we not we don't include in our uh, analysis. Um, so. The, one of the most uh, useful, versatile, um, resilient definitions that we've been working with recently is from Dinga Mansa. Um, and he's recently uh, expanded it just a little bit in a, a publication to come. But there are basically five elements of expressives, or as he discusses them, idiophones, um, to help us understand what we're working with. First of all, it's an open lexical class of words. Um, and this is important because Previously, well, previously, um, there's the question about how uh, productive speakers can be in creating new expressives. And there seems to be some leeway in some languages. However, it's not a free for all in terms of making up expressives however you go. Um, and also, this is important because we know that words can become expressivized. Borrowings can be turned into expressives. Uh, other lexical words can become uh, expressives. And words can also become de-expressivized. That is, they can fall out of expressive use and assume another, another uh, function in the language. So it's quite interesting. While, we, while we've uh, spent a lot of time um, saying how different expressives are, um, we're seeing more and more that they overlap and the, the connections to other parts of the lexicon and, and the grammar are um, very complex. The second element is that they're marked. That is to say that they're, they stand out in many ways, whether we're talking about phonology, whether we're talking about uh, uh, phonotactics, whether we're talking about the, the semantic aspects of them. The one key aspect is that they're definitely marked. And so they're considered to be strange words. They're, they're um, often considered to be on the margins. Um, the other part is that they are words. They have uh, grammar. They have... Uh, specific functions, we can describe them. Um, and in terms of meaning, there are, in many cases, quite quite a good uh, 
agreement among among speakers about how they're used and how they how they uh, what they mean. Um, so we need to to consider them as as words, even though they don't look or sound like words, uh, so to speak. Sometimes they're also depictive, um, and by this we mean they're not. This is in opposition to descriptive. So when you use expressives, you are evoking images and not just providing uh, information. Uh, in some places of Southeast Asia where I work, local people have described these as words that paint pictures. Um, and so uh, that's a, a, a interesting uh, way to think about what it is that is taken from an expressive when it is spoken and then heard. And finally, that they are about uh, vivid sensory imagery, um, so that they have a lot of detail about the the detail the the specifics of the sound and the sight and and the feel. <clears throat> Expressives and idiophones have typically been ignored by linguistics. Although in South Asia, we can say that there has been quite a lot of work uh, done in several languages over the years. Um, Although I think that it's fair to say that it hasn't really emerged or congealed yet as a as a solid study of of uh, of a solid area of study, um, some of the reasons that expressives have been been ignored by linguistics and as uh, Professor Mohan mentioned, ignored by description of uh, in descriptions of languages, um, that there's a difference between the prosaic and expressive phonology. Um, Expressive words sometimes have sounds that shouldn't be there in the language, shouldn't in the in the prescriptive descriptive sense. Um, there's also the interesting uh, feature that uh, some express some sounds in expressives are able to escape historical uh, sound change, and this provo this provo uh, is problematic for for description. There's some morphological ambiguity. Um, the way reduplication happens in many languages, and particularly in, in African languages where uh, things can be reduplicated many, many times uh, to achieve the expressive effect, um, and how to deal with, with this type of um, morphological, the processes that create these, these uh, sh marked words. Uh, expressives are, have been described as having a high degree of syntactic independence, that is, they are outside of the of the normal grammar of the language in in, in many many languages. Um, we do see that uh, there are ways of incorporating and there are practices of incorporating expressives into the grammar using quotative uh, particles such as the Tamil inna. Um, Japanese does something similar. Uh, Mundari does something similar, not with a quotative particle, but by using uh, tense aspect and and mood markers. Um, and they surprise us sometimes in, in where they appear in the, the structure of a, a sentence or an utterance. And then finally, uh, people have commented on the difficulty in, uh, oh, sorry, the, the complex semantics um, is uh, often a problem of glossing. Uh, it's very difficult to come up with the a, uh, a definition that is broad enough to capture the actual usage, but narrow enough to uh, Keep it manageable within a within a, a dictionary or a, a, a other types of uh, description, and then difficulty in elicitation. Um, it's often times that uh, you work with a speaker and try to get expressives from them, and it doesn't work. Um, this is often believed to be a problem of uh, the the need for having the direct experience to provoke the use of the expressive, um, but. As I've experienced, uh, oftentimes people are very, very attuned to expressives and are able to produce them, uh, not only produce them, but also to produce very uh, deep uh, descriptions and definitions. Um, but generally, we've we've considered it as as a, a, a quite a difficult part of the of the, the language to work on. Typically, the focus on work that has been done has been on the semiotics of sound, so the the iconicity problems, the mappings of sound to meaning. Um, and then also the processes of reduplication. Um, the meaning, the semantic aspect has often been simplified in order to look at other, other elements of, of the grammar, which have been uh, perceived to be more important. And the, the, the question of iconicity is, of course, uh, central to the whole uh, exploration of, of expressives. Um, and it has dominated uh, much of the attention for a long time. 
but recently it's been uh, the field is starting to expand a bit and uh, take a more uh, broad based look at, at what these words do. Um, what's been said recently about expressives that's uh, new and exciting in, in my perspective is that a more ethnographic approach to looking at these words uh, provides a lot of insight. Um, there's generally been a perception that expressives are vague, as I mentioned, because glossing is quite difficult, if not impossible. Um, but what we do see when we look at expressive use is that there are very high levels of linguistic and social nuance. Uh, a couple of comments that have been made by people who have uh, contributed greatly to the study of expressives. Um, Childs has mentioned uh, that ex expressive exists between the realm of nonconformist speech and recognizable language. So uh, yeah, basically trying to not look like language, but being required to continue to be language in order for people to uh, understand and use them. Expressives have been described as being between grammar and poetry. So the, the prescriptive rules and the creative uh, juices that, that uh, drive people in their language use. Um, Nuclos has described how expressives uh, work with clusters of attitudes and beliefs about causation, nature, and communication of perceptions. Um, and Webster has even talked about seductive poetics that provoke and evoke emotional reaction and even action among people. Uh, and because of this great range and depth of nuance, there's a need for ethnographic approaches to studying uh, expressives, which how do we define them? I don't want to say too much about defining them. However, a little bit of, of consideration of this will help uh, get a, a general grasp of, of what they look like and, and uh, what they do. Um, there's a lexical element that, and this is, I should say, this is uh, work that was started uh, by Professor Osada many, many, many years ago when he started working on Mundari expressives. Um, and uh, has been sort of our working guidelines for for identifying and, and considering expressives in our work. So there's a, a lexical element um, which uh, gives us patterns of reduplication um, where there are two words and neither of which has a discrete meaning. So for example, we have a word like bara buru, bubbles appearing on the surface of water. Um, and neither bara or nor buru have any meaning that can be gleaned from them. They're just uh, both there. Clearly, they're related to each other through the vowel uh, mutation, but neither of them give us any kind of semantic uh, clues as to what, what the meaning should be. <clears throat> Sometimes one or both of these words in a, in a, in a two-element uh, expressive can have meaning, but they seem to be directly unrelated to the expressive. For example, uh, the expressive atmat, which is an unknown, strange person, which is often said while observing someone sitting alone at a festival, eating and drinking without any interaction with local people. So sort of isolated uh, social situation of an individual. This, if we look at it, ad uh, can also be a verb to, to mean to lose one's way. Mat uh, means bamboo. And so neither of these seem to be directly uh, pointing to the meaning. Ad, to lose one's way may have something to do originally in history with uh, this kind of isolated social uh, environment. Um, but for a speaker, the two, it's, it's not uh, a word that is considered to be a compound of these two words. Um, and so even if, even if there was some uh, etymological link to ad in the, in the past, it's not perceived as so now. And so this may be an example of type of uh, expressivization that may have gone on uh, in history. There's a, sen a semantic element, the vivid sensory perception. Uh, we've already seen a few of those, but let me just throw another one here uh, to look at. For example, the, the expressive tosoe tosoe, which is the sound of an airy fart of the type experienced after eating jackfruit. And uh, I understand that this word can only be eating, can only be used after eating jackfruit. So uh, vivid and very specific uh, elements of, of sensory perception in the semantic element of, of the, the expressives. And of course, there are the, the morphological elements, um, the reduplication patterns again. Basically, we talk of, of four different uh, types 
in Mundari expressives. Um, the first being identical reduplication, of which uh, about 54% of our dictionary of Mundari expressives, uh, which has more than 1,500 uh, items, uh, are of identical reduplication, such as baya baya, doing something slowly. Non-identical reduplication uh, composes a vowel mutation, which is about 18%, and consonant mutation, which is about 22%. So the type of uh, vowel with garagiri, sound of buffalo running off in a, a group or a herd, and consonant mutation with 22 with agaram bagaram, which is a cluttered, cluttered disorganized uh, uh, situation. There's another type which we are calling awkward formations, which make only 6%, but are very interesting. And the word awkward formation is in itself a little bit awkward, but we're, we're uh, sticking with that for the time being because of just the, the, the formal characteristics of, of these words. One example is konko dorot, which is, uh, depicts something that's round and well-formed like a uh, ripening uh, rice panicle. And so these two, you can see, have no link to each other. They do, in this case, they do share the same vowels, but beyond that, uh, it's hard to think of this as a, a, a reduplication pattern. The last one is what we were calling Ken formations. Um, and Ken is a, is a tense aspect mood um, marker that functions in the, in the verbal morphology of, of Mundari. And you have things such as Chatta Ken, which is a single clapping of hands. And it's interesting because these seem to be derived from the, uh, the more typical two element uh, expressives such as Chatta Chatta, which is repeated clapping of the hands. Right. So I've alluded to uh, some work that we've been doing. Um, when I was in Kyoto, we had a, a project funded by the Japanese government, uh, which was called Beyond Arbitrariness. And uh, we had a, a, a team of people that were, the project was based at Kyoto University, um, a team of people who worked on uh, South Asian um, languages while we were there, and then a network of researchers that uh, expanded out uh, into both other languages both areas of, of South, Southeast and uh, East Asia as well. And that's where, that's where this work is, is coming from. So uh, characterizing Mundari expressives, um, we have a gr fantastic resource um, in, in Mundari, which is the Encyclopedia Mundarica, uh, which is a 16 volume, uh, well, it, it takes the form of a dictionary, but it's, it is an encyclopedia. It's a massive work. Uh, of from Hoffman's, which was uh, started to be printed in the early 1900s, um, which provides many examples of uh, language use, cultural practices, uh, history, etymology, uh, variation among among different varieties. Um, and within this fantastic work, there are many many expressives, um, and we learned a lot about this. It's a very good uh, baseline for for looking at. Uh, the scope of expressives in Mundari. But one interesting thing we find that despite a lot of uh, very helpful description, um, there's also a tendency to lump uh, similar forms together um, and just say that they're sort of variations of, of, of themselves, such as the ones that I've uh, circled here in red. So we have jebe, 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 jeber, jeber, job, job, uh, job, jobao, jobo, jobo, Jobe uh, jobe jobo jobor jobor so, and without uh, going into too much discussion about what the what the actual uh, differences are, are. and so, um, despite the the vastness of this work, it it still shows how uh, to do justice to the expressive meaning. It's still very very different. So when we began to work uh, on expressives, when I began to work on expressives, uh, Osadaji had been working on them for a long time with uh, Madhu Bortigi. Um, we began to develop a, a methodology. Um, and I want to describe a little bit of how this uh, worked, not from Mundari, but uh, an interesting session that I did uh, in Santali, a related language, um, because it can be difficult to get the expressive elicitation going. Um, you often start with common things such as uh, boiling water because the bubbling of water often is something that people can quickly uh, 
uh, latch, latch onto and, and produce an expressive. Um, and this speaker of Santali, who was uh, visiting Kyoto at the time, um, was very quick to give us several uh, expressives, such as bhut bhut, bokor bokor, uchila uchli, um, and we ended up at sing sing. And so the the this is the story about how uh, we unpack and unroll uh, expressive expressive meaning. So bhut bhut was uh, lightly boiling water, bokor bokor was uh, heavily bo boiling water, uchila uchili was water that was boiling over, and then we ended up at another one, uh, which he recalled after the discussion of these three, which was Sain Sain. And we were discussing what is Sain Sain. So came up with a sentence like this, which is the hot water is Sain Sain almost boiling. So it hasn't actually boiled yet. So Sain Sain was, was the, the, the step before Bhut Bhut, uh, when the water started to boil, which was great. Um, and then uh this uh consultant said it's also used uh for when an arrow is flying by so we have the arrow fly by same thing same word same expressive then he said that it's also used to depict when a snake darts off quickly same thing so three very different uses uh of the same expressive here and we also have for Santali the Bodings Dictionary, which is also another fantastic resource, um, which gives whizzing, buzzing, rustling, stertuous sound, um, such as rice being thrown into boiling water, vultures flying past, or stone launched from a sling, or a cobra running away. Um, so we find very similar uh, depictions in in his use of this expressive sensing. And when we are talking about uh, what this really means. One important element that wasn't captured in Bodding's dictionary in his, uh, his uh, definition was that all of these, all of these phenomena have a, an expected outcome. There's a tension building to something that you know is going to happen. For example, when the water is about to boil, we know that it's about to uh, transform itself into a but put or even a bokor uh, bokor situation. When the arrow is flying by, it's the sound that goes by, but it's also the expectation that the arrow will hit some target. There's going to be a, a definite outcome. The snake was a little bit uh, less clear, but as talking about it, we realized that the snake darting off quickly, same thing, was usually used when the snake was about to strike. So there's going to be a snake bite at the end of this. Um, so we uh, realized how we can, we can snowball uh, the expressive meanings uh, going through different uh, use occurrences that seem to be uh, unrelated, um, but actually are related uh, in in several ways that aren't so so obvious. And the 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 S sound uh, probably is what's related to this whizzing or rustling sound. Um, but there's also the the in addition to the sound, there's also the, the kind of emotional or or psychological expectation of some specific outcome. When we started working, um, Osadaji had already compiled uh, more than a thousand expressives and they had been given um, Japanese definitions and there were uh, examples uh, provided. And in the project, we decided that we would go through all these to uh, give English glossing, English definitions and uh, translate the, the examples as well to open up the uh, information to a wider audience, and we produce the Dictionary of Mundari Expressives. Um, as I mentioned, it's uh, over 1,500 uh, elements, uh, still growing. It seems each time we work on on, on something, we find more um, expressives. And this was uh, transformed also into a sort of comparative reference because um, since we had others working um, in the project with us, where we could, we included uh, Bengali, uh, Kuruk, um, other languages uh, that shared similar forms um, as the beginnings of a, of a larger comparative effort. Um, in, the, the, in the collection of the initial words, there was also a lot of information about other locally spoken languages, such as uh, Sadani, 
um, other varieties of Munda. And so we, we developed something that was focused on uh, doing justice to the, to the semantics, but also starting to lay the groundwork for something more comparative that would uh, be uh, interesting in the regional context. Um, and the, the work that I'm going to share now basically uh, came out of the, the process of going through uh, this entire dictionary with Maduji uh, and re-looking at the meetings, discussing um, how they're used, um, and looking very closely at the, at the, uh, the definitions and the, the, the examples. So we consider them to be um, a type of ethnopoetics, which means we need to look very closely at the texts um, be very careful about the way we uh, translate things um, and to recognize the aesthetic aspects of uh, uh, expressive use. And the, the aesthetics aspects of it is extremely, extremely important. Um, the basic methodology that we developed after this was to base our work on the existing dictionary, but to go through and, as I mentioned, just discuss uh, the meanings in, in great detail. Discussion of a word um, often produced a song or a story, uh, some sort of text in which the expressive was used um, in a, uh, shall we say, a, a community situation, that is within a shared um, context of cultural reference with specific texts. Um, this is the, the, the first story uh, the first song that I, I mentioned in the first slide is, is an example of this. Um, and in the, in the discussion of the expressives, we would use a combination of uh, discussion of the existing material, materials, elicitation of different examples and uses, um, and then reference to other texts, um, which were uh, recalled and, and brought into the discussion at certain times. Um, so this is Maduji, who uh, has taught us all so much about Mundari expressives, and I think I can uh, let you just hear. We're this is a uh, discussion of some expressives, which led to a, a story, which she's in the process of telling, and the story, which includes a song within it. So I'll just let you uh, uh, hear the transition and give you a sense of of how our field work uh, was going. So that was working in in this the the course of one section working from the dictionary data that we had to a discussion uh, of the expressive to a, a song that was uh, a story that was recalled because it had the song and then looking at the at the song. Um, we also found that uh, the the discussion of the of the meaning would have um, enactments or reenactments of different types of, of expressions or uh, facial expressions or uh, gestures uh, to to elucidate further the meaning, um, and I will talk about that in a, in just a second. Um, just as the boiling water provided a a catalyst starting point for expanding uh, the look at expressives in a certain semantic group, um, expressives that uh, depict different types of dal. Uh, having to do with food, um, caught our interest and uh, led to a discussion which we thought very nicely uh, we could call sticky semantics because this was about the the stickiness that uh, you experience when you're eating dal. 
Um, and we found a large number of words that uh, had the shape of L with a verb and then a D or a T, some sort of uh, coronal sound, um, all with very uh, specific um, characteristics. Um, and we found that there was a networked, um, there were networked elements of meaning, uh, all com com contained in the in the semantic uh, profile of of these words. So that there was something about wetness and uh, stickiness, uh, mostly wetness and the, the degree of softness. So we had something like lidapada, which the the water in the the preparation of it was just right. The water balanced. The consistency was thick and stiff. In the ingredients, there was the full bean shape was left, but soft. They had not begun to disintegrate. Um, they're good to eat with uh, roti, scoops up nicely, but does not stick to the fingers uh, much. And this type of uh, dal was preferred. Um, similar form, but with a different vowel situation going on. Ledepede. Again, the water uh, was just right but the consistency was thin, maybe some uh, small bubbles on the surface. The beans were cracked in small places uh, and soft because the pieces were cooked too quickly. Um, it was good to eat with rice because of, of the consistency. Didn't stick to the fingers, but generally uh, gave the impression of being overcooked and uh, was getting thin and losing its fragrance. So we've got, we've got uh, elements of... of uh, wetness, softness, uh, tactile commentary about what it is like to touch it, how it goes with other foods, um, the experience and the process of cooking it, and also uh, preferences, subjective preferences, cultural pre preferences for um, how this would be uh, received when actually served. Um, and so the idea that that was was troubling at first was that there didn't see to be, seem to be a core uh, element of, of the semantic uh, weight of the word that uh, stuck out, but rather, as I said, a networked um, mapping of different semantic elements, some of which were uh, emphasized and some which were de-emphasized, um, depending upon the, the situation. Um, this became even more clear when we realized that many of these uh, expressives that are used to depict dal actually are often used with uh, words of bovine defecation, shall we say. Uh, so le de pede, the, the soft, uh, more watery uh, dal can also be used uh, to, do, to depict a watery type of diarrhea. Um, and many variations on the same uh, the same consonant setup with vowel mutation um, de depicted a, a very uh, different but very rich uh, array of different types of imagery um, that have to do with uh, cows and their defecation or children. Um, and so it was interesting uh, to, to imagine how uh, something that that was used so commonly for, one of the main uh, food items that is eaten with this uh, area of semantics. And the looking at the, the very closely at the at the this networked semantic elements um, situation, it's it seems to be clear that there's it's not a matter of sort of abstract uh, metaphor going on, but that the the semantics of it are, are being extended um, very uh, in, with high nuance uh, into this other area of, of uh, semantics, which socially um, may not seem to, to want to go together uh, very nicely. <clears throat> in eliciting and discussing the expressives, um, there was a lot of uh, gesture in the production of, of expressive meaning. Um, it's been recognized recently that that gesture and uh, nonverbal language goes quite closely with ex uh, with expressives in the production of of uh, these words in speech, and it's becoming it's becoming uh, more of an important uh, area of research within expressives as well. But um, this uh, was very uh, evident when we were talking about different types of eating. 
Um, this is from an, an article that came out of our work, um, uh, which talks about multimodal uh, depiction and different social types. So talking about different types of eating, we came uh, across three common ones, lugum lugum, sarsor, and sodor bodor. And Maduji um, explained this, but for these ones particularly, there were very clear gestures uh, being produced in trying to get us to understand. So lugum lugum, which was the appearance of chewing with cheeks puffing in and out, was done in a way that the mouth was closed and the, was was uh, tracing a sort of round circular motion in the, in the cheeks. When we discussed it, turned out that this is the way people who don't have other teeth tend to chew gumming food um, and is indexical of babies and old people who, of course, don't have uh, perhaps full sets of teeth and tend to chew in a different way um, on their food, lugum lugum. So if someone uh, is chewing in that way with their mouth closed, making large movements, uh, clearly shifting the food around inside, um, lugum lugum could be used to uh, depict uh, this type of, of eating, but also uh, adding this uh, culturally embedded uh, indexing of uh, babies and old people as a type, as a social type. Sarsor, um, which we uh, defined as noisily eating with slurping sounds. Um, since we were in Japan at the time, uh, she commented on this is the way the Japanese people eat their ramen, eat their noodles with a lot of uh, sound, a lot of slurping, and often with the head uh, going up and down. And as we discussed this, uh, it uh, turned out that this is sort of indexical of the way a pig eats. Um, and so when someone uh, eats sarsor, we're talking about slurping and uh, noise that may not be so appropriate for, for the, the eating situation, but also um, a sort of uncontrolled um, and uh, slightly wild uh, set of activities uh, of motions um, that people, for example, in this case, we described using a Japanese style eating of noodles, but uh, again, brought in the social social uh, index of, of a pig. Sodor bodor, uh, messily eating with pieces of food stuck on the lips and face, um, was also sort of an, an abnormal type of eating that was uh, did not carry positive imagery. Um, and as we discussed, uh, this type of uh, this type of um, eating, um, it became clear that. Uh, it was indexical of the way monkeys um, may fling things around um, when they're eating or even when they're uh, delousing each other, uh, moving their hands and, and moving things around. And so, again, while the, 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 the initial purpose of Sodor Bodor is to, is to talk about food being stuck on the face in a sloppy and uh, messy eating, um, again, it, it evokes images of something that is... Uh, not human, but perhaps human-like, and uh, basically a, a common reference that people can can look onto. Uh, and so these these uh, this indexation of different social types uh, we found to be a very important aspect of uh, the expressives, which is sort of beyond the direct um, depiction of, in this case, styles of eating with the different sounds, but with the uh, the types, the social types that are indexed um, when we see what these actions, uh, how these the actions are in interpreted. Um, so there are judgments that go along with these. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about sort of what is abnormal or what is preferred, whether we're talking about uh, preparation of dal or different types of eating. And it turned out that a lot of the expressives that uh, we were working with seem to be uh, we could consider them to be moral propositions. That is making very clear statements about, um, yeah, morality, um, ethics, and highlighting a lot of uh, beliefs about what it is to be Munda, what it is to behave in Munda society, uh, what it is to, in many cases, use the Munda language, um, and pointing towards uh, a lot of different ideas about, about uh, community. Um, this expressive, rather long one up here, which has Hadda Huddu, um, which we initially uh, 
learned was working together quickly and efficiently. So a type of, of kind of an economic look at uh, how uh, people would do work in clearing fields. Um, this is the example was about harvesting a rice field and how they finished it in one day. Um, but upon further examination, we had the hudu in this usage was not just talking about something that was an, an economic problem of, of efficiency or effectiveness, um, but in fact uh, was a sort of group uh, psychological state, uh, a feeling of enjoyment uh, that people are working together. And the key to this was that um, groups that can work had the hudu in, in the field work are usually groups that are organized uh, without uh, monetary pay, but groups that are sort of more traditional labor exchange groups that will be treated to a nice uh, meal afterwards, um, which was called a jilu nala, so a meat work group, meaning that they would get a, a, a good uh, meal afterwards. And so that had the hudu was about speed and efficiency, but it was also about the about the community feeling of enjoyment, the anticipation of a uh, nice meal coming at the end that you would share then together. Um, and again, indexing the feeling of, of cohesive intimacy um, uh, in a, a, an important area of, of the shared group um, livelihood. <clears throat> um, when we talk about speaking, uh, the sort of the moral proposition uh, can also talk to matters of daily life and speaking, for example. Um, there are many, many Mundari expressives uh, about how people speak, including fluency and uh, lack of clarity and enunciation, uh, different types of gossiping, uh, speaking bad about people, um, saying things that are not appropriate in, in certain social settings. <clears throat> and all of these have uh, very clear ideas about how uh, that type of communication fits into the dominant social mores. Um, one simple example of how how uh, the the social, uh, in this case, the possibly the the ethnic underpinnings of of ways of speaking, um, is uh, two expresses about speaking fluently, uh, quickly, um, and effectively. The first partar partar was uh, speaking fluently, skillful, and effective. But this is often used to depict someone who is, for example, fluent in Hindi, someone who's successful in accessing external world of benefit and prestige. So someone who speaks in this way is, is seen as being uh, connected to the outside world, um, perhaps uh, too much connected to the outside world, uh, according to traditional lifestyles and, and values. Um, as I mentioned here, someone who's accessing different sources of benefits and prestige, so there could be feelings of uh, jealousy or resentment um, that have to do with uh, sort of the inside and outside dynamics of of a of a community. On the other hand, tal tul speaking again with fluency and a convincing effort is more likely to depict uh, the type of speech of a skilled speaker of of Munda Mundari. Um, maybe the power of a storyteller to keep their audience's attention, to deliver important messages in ways that are aesthetically pleasing um, in Mundari language. So indicating not only different types of speech, which would have sound and other auditory um, characteristics, but uh, also the motivations and the, the ideas about inside community and outside community, um, all the way to uh, certain connotations of, of economic uh, benefits and, and social interactions in broader networks. Um, expressives have been discussed um, exclusively today until now as a part of um, oral culture, tradition, oral tradition and cultural transmission uh, are very closely linked. However, as, uh, as you know, the um, expressives in the South Asian linguistic area are not limited to um, oral language. They're appear in, in literature and other written works as well, and are very important. Um, um, in the Mundari work we've done, um, it's been mostly looking at, at oral texts. Um, but um, the 
use of expressives within written tradition is also uh, quite important for other groups in the in that area, such as uh, Santali. Um, as part of our project, there was a look at uh, how a new body of poetic works uh, is being formalized um, as a larger a larger uh, project of um, creating a, a literature a body of literature for Santali in asserting uh, modern uh, visions of ethnicity and, and community um, ethnic identity and found that many of these poems, uh, particularly the the ones that were brought up in, in this work were of Sadhu Ramchand Burmu, who's drawn on traditions of sung performance and children's tales to create a feeling of raska um, in his, in his uh, modern poetry. And the raska was described as the pleasure that's found in the relation between individuals and their social surroundings. So use of these uh, more traditional and somewhat uh, specialized uh, poetics in a more uh, modern and uh, sort of effort to to establish the the literary tradition of, of Santali people today um, focus on the the aesthetic experience that's created by using these types of, of poetics which are uh, exemplified by um, the use of expressives um, and it was it's it's uh, been shown that this experience of raska, while being an aesthetic uh, experience, is also extremely important in transmitting the elements of truth within stories that mediate between human spirits and ancestors. So again, doing the work of uh, creating a pleasing language experience to something that has very uh, deep and heavy cultural work as well. Oops. Uh, so I've been talking about uh, some fairly local uh, discussions. As Professor uh, Mohan mentioned in his introductory, and as everyone knows, expressives are an important part of the linguistic area uh, in South, South Asia. And so I'd like to make a few comments about how we can consider scales of resolution, uh, that is scaling up from, from this uh, very uh, micro field level work to uh, yeah, other, other levels of, of analysis and, and perhaps comparison. So I don't need to say a lot about this, but just to uh, uh, confirm the, the basic point, uh, Emino's 1969 uh, very influential article on uh, onomatopoetics as a core element of the linguistic area showed that there are, I think we can say shocking similarities across languages of different uh, language families. Uh, in terms of form, in terms of meaning, uh, raising all sorts of questions about uh, multilingualism, etymology, cultural contact uh, in deep history of the of the region. Um, in the the micro linguistic area where Mundari is spoken, uh, the example of Jakamaka, which I'm sure uh, many people will uh, recall from other languages that they speak about shining brightly. Santali has Jakmak, Karia, another Austroasiatic language, has Jakamaka, Kuruk, Dravidian language, has Jakamaka, and Sadani, Indo-Aryan Indo language, has Jakamaka. So uh, the question about how this happened over history is, is something uh, that has got some attention, needs much, much more work. Um, Emino's uh, analysis has showed that there is a, a good possibility that um, there has been borrowing of uh, words very, very back in history that have become expressivized. Um, and one of the reasons that we uh, have built a comparative element into our, our dictionary is because we want to look at how this uh, is reflected in daily patterns of multilingualism in places like Jharkhand, where um, people are speaking multiple languages and in contact um, and discussing uh, daily life in ways that have very expressive elements. And so I um, feel that it's, it's quite important to, to look at um, how uh, expressives are used in contemporary settings, contemporary multilingual settings um, as well, to understand uh, some of the social history uh, that could have helped bring about this uh, remarkable phenomenon of, of uh, shared expressives 
um, in South Asia linguistic area. Um, in the dictionary, for example, um, we realized that uh, when we were putting uh, Bangla uh, words into the dictionary, we luckily our speaker of Bangla, one of them spoke Jharkhandi Bangla in addition to more standard. And so we realized that the Jharkhandi Bangla uh, seemed to have quite a, a bit more similarity directly with Munda languages, uh, which would make sense considering that uh, in Jharkhandi Bangla, there's been a history of contact um, and uh, yeah, and multilingualism that would, would uh, bring about something like that. So it's quite indicative of uh, much more that can be said, I think. So starting off saying that expressives have been ignored um, is the way we often do it, but um, obviously there's been a lot of work done and it seems to be that there's a, a deepening field developing here. Uh, some major works recently uh, in the South Asia linguistic area, Williams um, has edited a, a very nice volume on expressive morphology that uh, takes much of the, the previous work on reduplication and other morphological functions in, in South Asia uh, to the next level of, of analysis and depth in terms of looking at different languages and different phenomena within that. Um, the edited volume that came out of our project in Kyoto, um, which was edited by me and uh, Nishan Choksi, who's at the Institute of Indian Institute of Technology in Gandhinagar uh, now, um, also tries to bring this multidisciplinary approach to look at not only syntax and semantics, but also performance uh, and other areas of, of description of local language use. Um, in addition to bringing to light some previously undescribed uh, languages uh, as sort of a, a, I won't say a model, but as a, as a, a, a effort to instigate more uh, research into these, these issues from different perspectives. Moving up the scale again, we should remember that Mundari is not only part of the, the South Asian linguistic uh, area, but it's also an Austroasiatic Attic language, which means that it is related to a huge group of languages uh, to the east. Um, and uh, in this area as well, this area is also considered to be a linguistic area with uh, expressives very commonly found, very rich in the linguistic culture as well. Um, uh, we are able to look at both. So in, in, the, in, in the, the Mundari case in Jharkhand, we focus on uh, language contact, possibly as, as some of the, the, the key history. Um, in we look, when we look in the Austroasiatic uh, context, we open ourselves up to a different view on, on history, on historical relationships, uh, inheritance, and uh, different change trajectories. Um, that could be brought about. Just briefly, for example, in, in Mundari, a long, tall, straight tree, for example, that's that's growing uh, yeah, straight into the air, uh, would be depicted as birbor. Um, if that long, uh, stiff, straight object started to sway a little bit, uh, as a tree might in the wind, then it would be depicted as lirlor. So B going to L, and there seems to be in, in, uh, in Mundari, many occurrences of the L, uh, which uh, depict uh, softness or swaying, some sort of soft movement. Um, in a language spoken in Laos called Bit, um, expressives are extremely common, um, similar in terms of intensity to what, what it happens in, in, in Mundari. Um, and there's an expressive prefix of L, which means exactly uh, softness, soft moving, light movement, uh, back and forth. Um, and so we're, we're posed with the interesting uh, possibility that there may be elements of iconicity that are shared as a historical um, retention, perhaps. Um, and then also, uh, we get to think about even larger um, possibilities in terms of, of iconicity um, uh, in, in mapping sound and meaning. Um, in South Asia, I'm sorry, in Southeast Asia, we get into some additional semantic areas. For example, in this bit language, there's a large number of uh, expressions that depict silence, absence, things where there is nothing to describe, so to speak, um, and bringing the, the experience of that absence uh, in terms of psychological states, in terms of expectations, in terms of what presence 
that absence is depicting. Um, and uh, I think that when we look at these different approaches to the semantics of things within a language, it, it helps uh, raise other, other angles for looking at the languages that we're working on. So I think that there's a, a great, great potential for uh, exploring more uh, comparative uh, cross-regional work in understanding how expressives create social meaning and moral frameworks, in addition to questions about iconicity and, and uh, syntax as well. So to wrap up, um, we've looked at expressives in the local linguistic ideology uh, ecologies. Uh, it's obvious to say that we've only begun to scratch the surface of understanding expressives in actual language use situations. Um, we see clearly that expressives involve embodied performance and their meanings are context situated Sensory perception is accompanied by the creation of social meaning, values, and expectations. Um, expressives are an important part of Mundari linguistic ideology. That is, people uh, use expressives as a uh, part of their aesthetic grammar. They are um, part of a cultural system of ideas about social and linguistic relationships. Together, they load moral and political interests. Um, they are, I think we can say, when we consider expressives as a linguistic ideology, it turns around the assumption that we may still bring to the, to the table, which is that uh, expressives are marginal to the language. And they're certainly not marginal to the language. They're only marginal to the study of the language, um, I would propose. And expressives can even reflect attitudes on social change, interethnic relations, and community identities. So in the future, um, there's a need to understand more of the variation amongst the similarity. So the point is that in South Asia, we are struck with the similarity, um, which is a very interesting thing to explore. But because languages deal with expressives in so very different ways, uh, we need to focus on the variation aspects amongst all the similarity to really unpack what we've, what we've got. There's a very, very dire need for more basic documenting in lesser known languages. Uh, we need to look at expressives in a broader range of linguistic performance realms, so songs and rituals and uh, areas of ecological knowledge, perhaps. Um, we need to recognize the multilingual elements of these societies and the context in which expressives are spoken. Uh, we hope that there will be more efforts to create link, uh, expressive dictionaries um, that recognize the depth and complexity of, of the meanings, the expressive meaning. Uh, we need to unpack more to understand how expressives can reflect uh, communities, linguistic communities, uh, views on their own language use, on their, their uh, preferences for aesthetics, their preferences for uh, styles of making uh, moral assertions for defining ethnic identity. And we need to take more comparative studies within and beyond the South Asian linguistic area. So with that, I thank you for your patience in listening to the story. Johar, um, I'm very happy to provide full references uh, for some of the things that I mentioned in the, in, the, uh, in the presentation. And I should also mention that if anyone's interested in the, 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 the book that, uh, that Nishant and I have edited, I'm happy to give more information, including a, uh, uh, a discount code for the book, which Brill um, kindly provided uh, for this event. So uh, with that, I thank you again. And uh, uh, yeah, look forward to comments and questions. Thank you, Nathan, very much for your fantastic talk on expressives in Mundari. It's indeed a very uh, important uh, topic and even though it started like this uh, concept started long back and people are still working on exploring more and more and we're getting newer insights day by day i was very much fascinated by uh, madhu's uh, performance in that elicitation of yours i think that's a wonderful way of getting more uh, data on this topic uh, the more uh, i think we should also have uh, more and more uh, methods of eliciting expressives because it's not an easy task. I'm amazed by 
the uh, dictionary like i do have a copy of it like i told you showed it to you earlier also it's amazing that you have plenty of uh, expresses almost 300 pages you have it's not easy most of us who are documenting languages experience this and uh, for uh, describing uh, grammars people try to maybe a lot one or two pages to expressives but there is my you know very well like it's much more than um, what uh, we can think of more just people would like to talk about okay full forms of reduplication or partial forms and give a few examples but in, in your talk uh, you opened up uh, a new way of eliciting data on at uh, different stages of some um, verbs for example boiling like there are different stages and each stage you like to try to explain that there is a change in the way they express even farting after eating jackfruit i was amazed that you have a separate uh, word in mundari for that that is also very expressive so it's a very very interesting talk i now open this talk uh, formally for uh, interactions there are please the audience uh, please feel free to interact with the speaker yes professor subarak yeah thank you thank you for an interesting talk i have one question maybe i missed part of it i just had to leave briefly for 5 10 minutes the question i have is there any difference between expressing an instantaneous action versus a continuous action in terms of the single occurrence of the expressive and the multiple occurrences of the expressive for example i am a speaker of telugu and uh, suppose some instantaneous action i do not repeat it like for example somebody something fell with a thud i said done and the quotative as you rightly said in many languages have a quotative especially dravidian so dhan ani ani is the quotative in telugu padadu is fail okay uh, the water is flowing with beautifully with sound then since it's a continuous action you say jala jala ani again the ani comes okay so did you notice that kind of thing in uh, mundari and did i miss that point when you said it i don't uh, can you explain yes thank you uh i don't i don't think you missed it because i didn't uh describe it in such detail um so in in mundari the basic form of expressives is already in that what would look like a reduplicated form um and so um there's only one there's only one instance when we have the the former um with just one element with the ken and that is actually d that is a process of d uh reducing it to a single action right and but it's quite a it's quite a marginal process within munda um what the way there are differences between singular action or a continuing action but these are are sort of built into the expressive probably from an older uh stage of the language where that type of information is coded is is encoded through the the coda and so for example if you have a, an expressive with an m in the final position like jaram jaram then that will often indicate that it's a continuing action and so there it seems that there was maybe a system of of suffixes or some sort of marking with a within the basic syllable structure that would encode that there's another way to um to focus the meaning of the expressive on the individual's own reflexive experience of it with it with an r with an r coda um so there there are many things that can be done that it's not productive and so we see that there it's kind of fossilized in the in the structure of the words uh 
now. So it functions um, quite differently than Dravidian. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you. And uh, okay. uh, one more question I have, if you permit me. Uh, there is no repetition of any functional category. That is, for example, a tense marker, an aspect marker. Uh, that type of repetition is not found. Am I right? If, I'm, of course, they are leading you to reduplication, but not necessarily reduplication. Is there any expressive element of any functional category, which I doubt it won't be there? They they can take uh, one of the common uh, tense aspect mood markers that usually is used with verbs. Um, but they don't they don't have to be. And there's a there's a difference. Uh, there's a sort of nuanced difference between what happens when it is when it does take this TAM marker and when it doesn't. Um, and this is related to a, a, a really interesting discussion um, about what it means for expressives to be integrated into the syntax and the degree of integration uh, seems to have at a, at a sort of cross linguistic scale, the degree of syntactical integration seems to be inversely correlated to the expressivity okay. of it. And so when, when it's, when it's, when it takes a quotative or it takes the, uh, the, the aspect marker, for example, then it seems that the expressiveness may be reduced a little bit. And so the initial proposition that expressives are isolated from the syntax is related to the is to the the expressive quality, to qual quality of the of the, the okay. meaning. I, that I expected that. Thank you, yeah. thank you for that. The same thing. Same thing seems to happen in Japanese, um, as well. And so this is this is why it's interesting to take a much more nuanced view on where it sits within the syntax because it's not just a matter of is it a verb, is it really an, an expressive, but in which situations is it closer linked to other. Uh, aspects of, of prosaic expre uh, prosaic syntax and how does that interact with the index the the expressivity of it yes thank you thank you thank you any other questions comments feedback Professor Uma, I should I should uh, reiterate again after you show the dictionary that the more than 300 pages of that work is uh, thanks to more than 20 years of work by Osadaji and Maduji on on uh, that work, showing that really you know these projects need to be long term and and deep. But I wanted to make sure that my role is uh, uh, particularly. But within that dictionary, one of the most interesting things for us will be to include more Dravidian data. Because the, the historical Dravidian and, and Austroasiatic links are, of course, interesting. Um, and what uh, Emino already said about the possibility of lots of Dravidian origins for some of the, the etymological origins of, of these shared expressives. Um, and so, yeah, one of, one of the dream projects would be to, to build up more uh, Dravidian uh, data for those, for those words that we have. Yes, uh, I, I mean, Wasada is also with us here. It's very, it's an impressive work, I must say, because looking into that uh, entries, even the uh, the way you have structured the dictionary, like uh, it's a technical question, of course. Uh, I wish uh, Madhu was with us because uh, she would have been able to tell. And But the selection was, as you rightly said, probably Wasada G must have uh, paid attention to compilation of these uh, forms and trying to put them uh, like you already said that you had different uh, categorization like full re full reduplication or partial and you had awkward forms and you said six percent of them was they were awkward i'll come back to that in a moment but how how did you go about doing the headword selection and also, how was the linguistic information uh, packed into these headwords? I noticed, I don't read Japanese, so I do not, uh, I cannot comment on that. But I noticed that, like, for example, if you have uh, words like boo, boo or whatever, you have that 
uh, in uh, Devanagari script, that is Hindi, and you have used Japanese script, probably you are transliterating that, if I am right, by looking at the Hindi form. Then you also have usages of this, but I was curious to know, like uh, since, uh, since yesterday I was looking into this more and more, like Gusu Gusu, for example, like Gusu Gusu is a small form, which was there in Devnagri, you have transliterated, it's on page number 119, and uh, which means slow and quiet personality, not active or speaking much. Like we have that uh, Professor Subarav is here. The same form is there in uh, Tamil, like Kusu Kusu we say. That is uh, Kusu Kusu, like while talking to someone, whispering and more gossiping, very quietly you're talking, Kusu Kusu no Pesina. So it's the same for us that Gusu Gusu, what you say in uh, Mundari. But what is interesting to me is uh, the, uh, the form which is given in Japanese. Since I cannot read the script, it is too long. So I was wondering, is, it, uh, is there no equivalent in Japanese and you're trying to put a phrase to transliterate it or, or what is happening? And a related question, uh, what made uh, Osaba ji to give uh, Japanese equivalents in this uh, dictionaries and uh, what is the, uh, what do you, what, what are the implications for putting uh, Mundari Japanese bilingual uh, dictionary in this? I know you want to extend it to other languages, but let me begin with this and then maybe others can add to it also. Uh, let's see. I don't know, Osadaji, if he wants to answer. Um, let, maybe maybe I can just answer your first question very briefly. Um, the the Devnagari that is there is a Mundari representation because people are writing Mund, uh, Mundari and Devnagari, right? And so we we wanted to have that there just to make it more uh, um, complete as a as a as a head word. The Japanese is a definition. It's not a it's not a transcription, and you, we don't get the sound of pusu pusu from the Japanese. It's it's purely purely uh, meaning that we're giving there. Um, but the interesting thing to remember here is that because Japanese has so many expressives, um, in his original Japanese descriptions and de definitions, there were a lot of Japanese expressives used. So defining Mundari expressives using Japanese expressives, which is a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, undertaking, um, because the forms the forms are not similar in most cases, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, what you're seeing in the Japanese there is is it's the definition. It's not a, it's not a sound element at all. Okay, so it's basically you are giving explanations for the head words. In Japanese. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So if you yeah, look at I'm on that right. same page, if you look up, there's pukur pukur, pukur pukur, um, which is depictive of someone who is scared to the point that one cannot breathe easily. He uses the Japanese expressive doki doki, which is the sound and feeling of your heart beating very fast, and indicating that you have some sort of uh, psychological uh, being upset or or excited in some way. So that's what I should also mention. I'll, I'll I'll let him say whatever he wants about where it came from. But I should also say that in doing this work, um, Maduji and I used English, Japanese, Mundari, and some Hindi sometimes as well. So we did this work in in four languages, which was which was uh, quite important, I think, because it allowed us to bring different windows on on what we were talking about. Um, Yes, so Osadaji, if you want to talk about why you did this in Japanese first. <laughs> Is he there? Osadaji, are you there? Maybe he's... Uh... We see him. We see okay, him. He yes, uh, yeah. um, I think uh, Nate works is uh, independent from me. I, actually, he he and Madhu uh, working with together, and uh, uh, because uh, uh, actually uh, <laughs> we we are Japanese and uh, 
basically the we we cannot translate Japanese onomatope into English. It is very hard work, and uh, so that is why uh, Nate is uh, uh, taking uh, part in this project. So uh, he can uh, work uh, together with but without me <laughs> this is, we have to insist on this part of so uh he's working uh is uh, totally independent from me so uh basically my selection is uh, very easy i we have a lot of uh, japanese onomatope dictionary and some dictionaries uh, uh uh, how do you say the indication some uh, animation type uh, so uh, that kind of dictionary I uh, basically uh, utilize uh, or collecting uh, mundari uh, expression so uh, after that uh, I uh, went to Australia and uh, Nick Evans uh, asked me to complete this dictionary. So uh, we went there in 2016. Then uh, meanwhile, the Nate is much interesting in uh, expression in South Asian context and the Southeast Asian context, both, both contexts and the Australasiatic, both, both area. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that is why he taking part in uh, this project. Uh, that, that is a uh, brief story. That's all, yeah. Yeah, this thank is, uh, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. I think uh, what I understand uh, from this is maybe you people are uh, aiming towards a cross-linguistic uh, semantics of expressives by looking into South Asian and Southeast Asian because Japanese is Southeast Asian, we see that. And maybe like uh, how uh, Nathan was saying, maybe you are going to expand your database and uh, add more languages. Of course, there are a lot of Indians who are uh, probably uh, willing to join uh, in contributing to your uh, database because it's a very important uh, topic. In, that needs uh, attention because it's not it's not just a simple uh, grammatical form that deserves only two pages in any grammar book. We want to understand the culture of the people and the worldview of uh, different communities. That way, it will be nice to expand uh, this more. And maybe since you people have already uh, started and you have a uh, lot of experience working for more than two decades, like Osada, for example, and others, it would be nice if you are going to come out with some uh, um, interface like uh, using uh, some kind of interactive database where you can ask, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud, where people can put their uh, definitions or explanations in different languages are related. They may be genetically related or un genetically unrelated, but it would be interesting to see and afterwards come out with a cross-linguistic uh, semantics of uh, uh, expressives uh, first within India and then maybe we can go into Asia, I mean Southeast Asia, South Asia, other languages. Yeah, I just wanted to ask one last question and I think Shalendra also has a question. My question is on uh, the terminology awkward formation like, uh, I mean, uh, of course, you already said uh, it is awkward to call it awkward, but <laughs> so because uh, in any culture, there must be a reason uh, why they use uh, an expression in a certain way. So it would be nice to pull out these uh, so-called uh, awkward uh, formations and look deeper into it and probably sit with uh, Madhuji or someone uh, and look more into that deeply and see what's actually happening here. I'm sure there will be uh, a beautiful uh, terminology to explain such uh, expressions and why they are. I know you, we can say they are weird. It's weird for us, but definitely not for an AD speaker, right? So why are, why are they happening? Why did 
like conco doro why why did you decide they are expressive in number 1 so that means we are going beyond the form as simple as that if we are not just looking at the form if we are looking at the form we would not call it uh, as awkward or weird or whatever so there is much more play something else is playing a role there semantics pragmatics so something is playing a role and we have to see though they are only 6% maybe we will get more if we go deeper and uh, do a study specifically on this but this is just a comment we don't have to answer so <laughs> yeah I, i the the awkwardness is as you suggest in relation to the fact that most expressives you can see and hear and feel a balance and a rhythm you can see how vowels and consonants mutate you get a certain uh rhythm when you you say there's very there's a lot there's prosodic issues um and they have a different feel because of these and so when we looking at typologically within mundari they're awkward because they don't follow any of those uh, those patterns right and so the it's not to suggest that speakers feel they're awkward when they're saying them but as externals looking at it um and there probably is going to be a better word for it at some point um and i agree with you that looking at these ones would be really interesting and this is maybe where comparative work would be good because it's possible that you know they have a, a different history than than the the majority uh the the sort of the 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 canonical forms shall we say for for uh, mundari um and uh yeah i think that i think that we really need to to look at that it's going to probably highlight some areas of of history but as you say why then are they expressives well because like you said the semantics the pragmatics of it works in the same way as the others and so we believe that uh also based on the way speakers use them and and metadata about them then it it seems to it seems to make sense that they they be included but it's a it's a very very important and good point for for the future thank you thank you yeah thank you uh professor nathan i just had uh, one uh, i just want to understand that did you also consider one unit expressives like in hindi we have dham dhap and other and the reduplicated parts also the the single the the mono oh, no. yeah we don't have them because in most of the languages we did find even in nihali i did find that there are mono units in hindi we have dhap dham yeah. kind of a sound do occur in this uh, so i thought that whether that is also there in mundari also there may be no it's not a, no. no it's not it's not that very interesting well interesting and that's and i think that has to do with the 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 existence of this ken form because basically what you're doing is you're taping the 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 mono the sorry the 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 dual unit and then reducing it to a mono unit with this ken so it's it seems to also describe that uh yeah it's not it's not the way the system works okay chatta pata i could understand that that's a full reduplication unit in which you have Chat a distributive meaning that is coming inside so why do the repeat uh, usually in uh, reduplicated structures we usually have this uh, kind of a distributivity like ghar ghar kind yeah. of examples in which you can find that so that could, perhaps could be a reduplicated part rather than expressives maybe uh, yeah the the we 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 this is a very important point because when you say reduplication it assumes that you have a base yeah so if you say kara kara you assume that kara is there and you have kara but we can't in mundari we don't know which is the reduplicated form if we have jarar jurur we don't know which is derived from which and it's it doesn't seem that uh anyway we don't know what to say okay so uh, there is no way uh, we can predict that it is a leftward system or whether it's a rightward system but no. uh, yeah in my uh, data i came to know that it basically could be most possible uh, possibly the right word system rather than a left right. word because right. it's more of a suffixal in nature rather than a prefixal right. in nature and number right. two that can be understand that there could be a possibly uh, expressives better to be defined on semantic terms rather than going on the formal basis 
so that we can say that the meaning universal is already there, but there are uh, forms which may uh, depict, may not depict the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's related to the process of, of expressivization, where the meaning begins to shift in a way that is significant in the speaker's mind, uh, that it, it shifts categories and it, be, it is not, you know, a compound of a noun with a reduplication or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would, uh, while well, we mentioned uh, that in this book, there is a very nice chapter on Nihali written by Director Mohan uh, as well. And that's, the, the we we tried to bring some some languages that were uh had not been been uh described before so having nihali expressives was excellent another example from the south was solega yeah was uh described nice to have a, another uh uh dravidian tribal language but anyway thank you for the questions it's i wanted since you were speaking i wanted to reference your chapter yeah thank you yeah any other question Yeah, so we have been here for almost one hour, 45 minutes. Of yeah. course, this topic is an amazing topic, which uh, kept us all uh, hooked to the topic in many ways. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Uh, Nathan Bednock for sparing his time and for agreeing, agreeing to be with us and deliver this wonderful talk for, as part of the Foundation Day celebrations of the CIL. I'm uh, very glad that you, you could make it, though it took a lot of time and so many times we had uh, rescheduled the talk, but finally we could do it today. So I'm really happy for this. And this is already recorded and it is being live streamed on YouTube. Normally what happens after this is we get a lot of people viewing the YouTube. And they may write to you also. Sometimes they write to us and take the speaker's email. I'm just uh, telling you that in advance so that you can expect interactions after the talk as well. And I take this opportunity to formally thank you on behalf of our institute and on behalf of the director CIL on my personal behalf and on behalf of the audience who are here. Thank you so much. Do you want to say anything before we close? I just want to say thank you again for this uh, wonderful opportunity. It was an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I look forward to more uh, discussions on this topic into the future and hopefully in person. Yeah, fantastic. All right, have a lovely day. Thank you. So enjoy it. Yeah, nice seeing you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Manakam. Yes. Manakam. Manakam. Manakam.